fun guy. Top of page 112. So fun guy are single celled organisms that grow in irregular masses that include mold, mildew, and yeast. They can produce contagious diseases such as ringworms, mildew, another fungus uh, affect, affects plants and intimate objects, but does not cause human infections in the salon, spa, or barber shops. So the most frequently encountered fungal infection resulting from hair services is tinea barbe. So tinea barbe, also known as barber's itch, a person with tinea barbe may have deep inflamed or non-inflamed patches of skin on the face or the nape of the neck. Tinea barbe is similar to tinea capitis, a fungal infection of the scalp characterized by red papules or spots on the opening of the hair follicles. Next, we have ringworms, a fungal infection of the skin that appears in circular lesions in another fungus that may uh, contraindicate a beauty service. While all beauty professionals must avoid spreading scalp and skin infections, the increased risk for their for hair services is particular can be reduced by diligently cleaning and again disinfecting clippers and similar uh, cutting tools. Always refer to the manufacturer's direction for proper cleaning and disinfecting methods and recommendations. All right, we're now on page 113, parasites. Please put a star next to parasites scabies, and biofilms, and please highlight those sentences. Parasites are organisms that grow, feed, and shelter on or inside another organism, okay, while contributing nothing to the survival of that organism. They must have a host to survive. Parasites can live on or inside of humans and animals. They also can be found in food, on plants and trees, and in water. Humans can acquire internal parasites by eating fish or meat that has not been properly cooked. External parasites that affect humans by weight of the skins include ticks, lice, fleas, and mites. Services should never be performed on a client with visible signs of parasitic infestation always refer the client to a physician for treatment there are two types of parasites commonly encounter in the salon or spa or barbershop environment and that one would be the first one is head lice a type of parasite responsible for contagious diseases and conditions one condition caused by an infestation of head lice is called pediculosis capitis that is a technical term for head lice, pediculosis capitis. Next one will be scabies. So scabies is a contagious skin disease caused by the itch mite, which burrows under the skin. Contagious diseases and conditions caused by parasites should only be treated by a doctor. Contaminated countertops, tools, and equipment should be thoroughly cleaned and then disinfected with an EPA registered disinfectant for the time recommended by the manufacturer or with a bleach solution for 10 minutes. Biofilms. Biofilms are colonies of microorganisms that adhere to environmental surfaces as well as the human body. They secrete a sticky, hard to penetrate protective coating that cements them together. We're on page 114. The biofilm grows into a complex structure with many kinds of microbes. The sticky matrix substance holds communities together, making them very hard to pierce with antiseptics, antimicrobials, and disinfection, ultimately keeping the body in a chronic inflammatory state that is painful and inhibiting healing. One action of the biofilm community is to resist the body's defense mechanism. We are learning that biofilms play a large role in diseases and infection. 
Biofilms are usually not visible and must grow very large to be seen without a microscope. Dental plaque is an example of visible human biofilm. And algae colonies on ponds and slime and drains are examples of visible environmental biofilms. In the beauty wellness world, foot spas can harbor biofilm and require extra attention, especially pipe molds. Because biofilms are hard to detect, their presence and effects seem to be uh, underestimated. They're the ones, uh, they're one of the most significant scientific discoveries of the past few decades. Though we have much more to learn, um, conscientiously using infection control precautions, including standard precaution, cleaning, disinfecting, sterilization is the best method of prevention at the present time. We're on page 115. Employ the principles of prevention. Proper infection control can prevent the spread of disease caused by exposure to potentially infectious materials on an item surface. Infection control will also prevent exposure to blood and visible debris or residues such as dust, hair, and skin. Proper infection control requires two steps. This is important. Cleaning and then disinfecting with an appropriate EPA registered disinfectant. We already found out what it, a proper disinfectant is, right? When these two steps are followed correctly, virtually all pathogens of concern in the salon, spa, or barber shop can be effectively eliminated. Put a star next to the word sterilization. So sterilization is the process that destroys all microbial life, including spores, can be incorporated, but is rarely mandated. So effective sterilization typically requires the use of an autoclave, a piece of equipment that incorporates heat and pressure for sterilization to be effective. Items must be cleaned first, right, prior to the use, and the autoclave must be tested and maintained as instructed in by the manufacturer's specifications. The Centers of Disease Control Prevention, CDC, requires that autoclaves be tested monthly to ensure that they're properly sterilizing implements. The accepted method is called a spore test. Sealed packages containing test organisms are subject to a physical sterilization cycle and then sent to a con contract laboratory that specializes in autoclave performance testing. All right, so let's start with step number one, which is cleaning. So the first step in infection control is to clean. Remember that when you clean, you must remove all visible dirt, debris from the tool, okay? And equipment by washing it with liquid soap and water first or a chemical cleaner and using a clean disinfectant brush, okay? You want to, so the goal will be to Remove all visible debris and dirt by simply scrubbing it with soap and water, okay? When a surface is properly clean, the number of contaminants on that surface will be gr greatly reduced. In addition, proper cleaning removes any oils or residue from items that might interfere with disinfecting, being able to work properly. This is why cleaning is an important part of disinfecting tools and equipment. A surface, you guys, must be properly cleaned before it can be properly disinfected. Using a disinfectant without cleaning first is like using mouthwash without brushing your teeth. It does not work properly. Clean surfaces can still harbor small amounts of pathogens, but the presence of fewer pathogens means infections are less likely to be spread. Applying antiseptics to your skin or washing your hands with soap and water will drastically lower the amount of pathogens on your hands. Do not underestimate proper cleaning and hand washing. They're the most powerful and important ways to prevent the spread of infection. Bottom of page 116, there are three ways to clean your tools and implements. So again, washing them with soap and water 
and scrubbing them with a brush. A nail brush is perfect for that. Using an ultrasonic unit and using a chemical cleaner, okay? On page 117, hand washing. So proper hand washing, properly hand washing your hands is one of the most important actions you can take to prevent spreading germs from one person to another. Proper hand washing removes germs from the folds and grooves of the skin and under the free edge of nail plates by lifting and rinsing germs and contaminants from the surface of the skin. You should wash your hands thoroughly before and after working with each client. Follow the hand washing procedures that will be described at the end of the chapter, and I will show you guys that later. Antibacterial soaps. While there are many marketing claims on soaps these days, antibacterial soaps and antimicrobial soaps have been under the scrutiny of the FDA since 2014. In 2016, many of the chemicals used in these soaps were banned. What's more, Research has shown that repeated use of antibacterial products can actually increase the growth of some of the uh, worst pathogens. The true benefit of hand washing comes from the friction created by the soap bubbles that works uh, to pull pathogens off the skin surface. Repeated hand washing can also dry the skin, so using again a moisturizing hand lotion after washing is a good practice. Be sure the hand lotion is in a pump container and not a jar. Avoid using very hot water to wash your hands because this is another practice that can obviously damage your skin and make it even make them even more dry. Remember, you must wash your hands thoroughly before and after each service. So do all you can to reduce any irritation that may occur. Hand sanitizing, okay? Waterless hand sanitizers. Antiseptics, germicides formulated for use on skin and are registered and regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Antiseptics generally contain a high volume of alcohol and are intended to reduce the number and slow the, grow, the growth of microbes on the skin. When there is a visible dirt debris on the hands, neither waterless hand sanitizers nor antiseptics will work until the dirt or debris is removed. This can be followed only by, of course, you using soap and water uh, and a nail brush. Due to the drying effect of alcohol, hand sanitizer should not be overused, but if allowed by your state, they are excellent options when hand washing is not possible. Never use an antiseptic to disinfect instruments or other surfaces. Okay, so don't use a hand sanitizer to disinfect your working tools in between clients. That's not the proper way to disinfect implements. It is not effective for that purpose. Be warned that the high percentages of alcohol can again dry the skin to the point of causing openings that allow for infectious agents to infect you. With that in mind, only use hand sanitizers as a secondary option to hand washing. All right, we're now on page 118. Um, please put a star on the box that says caution. So it says caution, products and equipment that do not have the word disinfectant on the label are merely cleaners. They do not disinfect, okay? Please remember that. Common antiseptics used in the salon, spas, and barber shops. So, hydrogen peroxide has been used in homes and in the beauty industry forever. It is generally used at 3% strength and works well as an antiseptic. However, it should never be used on an open cut, okay, as it destroys the cells that begin the healing process in a wound. Isopropyl alcohol is effective in cleaning the skin. However, it can be very drying and cause irritation of the skin. Put a star next to that. Alcohol is not a disinfectant for surfaces, you guys, or implements, and should be used only as a cleaner 
or antiseptic only okay now let's talk about step number two we're at the bottom of page 118 highlight and put a star next to the following. The second step of infection control is disinfection. Remember that disinfection is the process that eliminates most, but not necessarily all microorganisms on non-porous surfaces. This process, however, is not effective against bacterial spores. In a salon, spa, or barber shops, disinfection is extremely effective in controlling microorganisms on surfaces such as shears, clippers, and other multi-use uh, equipment. Multi-use refers to as items that can be cleaned, disinfected, and used on more than one person. Disinfectants used in the shop must carry, again, an EPA registered number like the one I showed you guys earlier. And the label should clearly state the specific organism the solution is effective against when used according to the manufacturer's products instruction. Again, I'm reading all of this and it's becoming a little repetitive, but you get the idea. Remember that disinfectants are products that destroy most bacteria, not including spores, fungi, and viruses on surface. Disinfectants are not for use on human skin, hair, and nails. So never use an EPA registered disinfectant as a hand sanitizer. Never spray this on your hands or on someone's skin, okay? Um, never use disinfectants, again, as hand cleaners since it can cause skin irritation and an allergic reaction. And disinfectants are um, pesticides and can be harmful if absorbed through the skin, okay? Again, I'm gonna read where it says caution. Improper mixing of disinfectants to be weaker or more concentrated than the manufacturer's instructions can significantly reduce their effectiveness. Always add, listen to this, always add the disinfectant concentrate to the water when mixing and always follow the manufacturer's instructions for proper dilution, okay? So again, safety glasses and gloves should be worn while mixing to avoid accidents, uh, obviously from getting the solution in your eyes and or touching your skin. Choosing a disinfectant, you, you must read and follow the manufacturer's instructions again whenever you are using a disinfectant. Mixing ratios and contact time are listed on the product's label. Require for the disinfectant to visibly be moist to be effective against pathogens. Are very important and can vary and can vary widely based on the manufacturers and delivery delivery methods. So everyone's gonna have different instructions. So for example, most concentrates have um a 10 minute contact time, again, like the one I showed you, whereas most wipes have a two minute contact time. In general, as concentration goes up and contact time goes down, disinfectants become more um, corrosive and damaging to implements, meaning it can damage your tools. Not all disinfectants have the same concentration, so be sure to mix the correct proportion according to the instructions on the label. If the label, okay, put a star next to this, if the label does not have the word concentrated on it, the product is already mixed and must be used directly from the original container and must not be diluted. All EPA registered disinfectants, even though sprayed on large surfaces, will specify a contact time in their directions for use. Disinfectants must have an efficacy claim on the label. Efficacy is the ability to produce the intended effect as applied to disinfectant claims. Efficacy means the effectiveness with which a disinfecting solution kills organisms when used according to the label's instructions. Please highlight all of that and put a star next to it. I'm pretty sure you guys can see it here. So the proper use of disinfectants, again, implements must be thoroughly cleaned, 
we got that part down again you must properly clean okay all visible matter or residue before before being placed in a disinfectant solution this is because re uh, residue will interfere with the disinfectant and prevent proper disinfection okay properly clean implements and tools free from all visible debris must be completely immersed in disinfectant solution complete immersion means there is enough fluid in a container to cover all surfaces of the item being disinfected okay including the handles for 10 minutes or for again the time recommended by the company when using a spray wipe or aerosol disinfectant you must still look for and adhere to the contact time to ensure that all pathogens on the labels are being effectively destroyed okay we're on page 120. it's a lot of information we still have a lot to go it is a long chapter but a very important one that again you will be asked a lot of questions over infection control on your state board test okay types of disinfectants so disinfectants are not all the same some are appropriate for use in the beauty and wellness industry and some are not as a beauty professional you will primarily be using disinfectants that are effective for cleaning blood and bodily fluids from non-porous surfaces so non-porous uh, items are made up of material that has no pores or openings and that cannot absorb any type of liquids as opposed to porous materials that has holes or openings and is absorbent so an example of a non-porous surface will be like a table okay so a table will be non-porous something that will be porous will be a towel sponges okay they have openings and they absorb liquids so that will be a porous item all right now let's talk about quads quaternary ammonium compounds also known as quads are disinfectants you guys that are very effective when used properly on non-porous surfaces. The most advanced type of uh, these formulations are called multiple quads. Multiple quads contain sophisticated blends of quads that work together to significantly increase the effectiveness of these disinfectants. Quad solutions usually disinfect implements in 10 minutes put a star next to that as with an odd disinfectant leaving tools in a quad solution for prolonged periods of time of course can cause uh, dueling or damaging uh, of the tools they should be removed from the solution after the specified period and of course rinsed if required dried and then stored in a clean cover container all right tuberculocidal disinfectants are proven to kill the bacterium that causes tuberculosis in addition to other pathogens destroyed through the use of hospital disinfectants tuberculosis it is is a disease caused by a bacterium that is transmitted through coughing or sneezing it is passed through inhalation only and it is not transmitted by the hands or uh, picked up on surfaces on page 121 at the top please put a star and highlight the word phenoloic phenoloic disinfectants are powerful tuberculocidal disinfectants however just because these disinfectants are effective against the pathogen does not mean that you should automatically reach for them they are a form of formaldehyde and have a very high pH and can damage the skin and eyes. Phenoloic disinfectants can be harmful to the environment if put down the drain. They have been used reliably over the years 
to disinfect tools. However, they do have some, a significantly drawback. Phenol can damage plastic and rubber and cause certain metals to rust. Extra care should be taken to avoid skin contact with phenoloic disinfectants. Phenoloics are known carcinogens and as such should be used only in states that require their use. In those states, you should keep a tuberculosidal disinfectant readily available, but you should use it only when required. All right, next one is the good old faithful bleach. All right, household bleach, put a star next to that. 5.25% sodium hypochlorite is an effective disinfectant and has been used extensively in salons and spas forever, okay? Bleach used in a salon or spa or barbershop must be EPA registered as a disinfectant. Chlorine bleach is the only bleach that disinfects. So it is wise to always look for a disinfection instructions on the label to ensure that the bleach you are using is actually a disinfecting. Um, bleach is corrosive and can damage metals and plastics as well as cause skin irritations and of course eye damage. Now to mix bleach solution. So to mix a bleach solution, always follow the manufacturer's uh, instructions. Store the bleach away from heat and light. A fresh bleach solution should be mixed every 24 hours or when the solution has been contaminated. Now, that is a very uh, common, as I've been told, question on your state board exam, all right? You never know how they will ask you the question, right? They try to trick you, I know that. And by the way, if you didn't know, there's at least two to three different versions of the test. So if you and your friend go take the test the same day, chances are y'all are both taking a different test, okay? So again, let me reread this. A fresh bleach solution should be mixed every 24 hours or when the solution has been contaminated. After mixing the bleach solution, date the container to ensure that the solution is not saved from one day to the next, but rather disposed of daily like other disinfectants. Bleach can be irritating to the lungs, so be careful about in inhaling uh, the fumes. All right, on the box where it says, did you know, please um, highlight that first sentence and put a star next to it. Bleach is not a magic potion. All disinfectants, including bleach, are inactivated, okay, in the presence of many substances, including oils, lotions, creams, hair, and skin. If bleach is used to disinfect equipment, it is critical to use a soap detergent first, again, to thoroughly clean, rinse the equipment, and remove all debris, all right? Never mix detergent with bleach and always use bleach in a well-ventilated area. All right. Disinfectant uh, tips and safety. So never forget that disinfectants are poisonous and can cause serious skin and eye damage. Some disinfectants appear clear while others, specifically phenoloic disinfectants, are a little cloudy. Always use caution when handling disinfectants in addition to the tips below, all right? So always, always keep the SDS, which is safety data sheet, on hand for the disinfectant you are using. Always wear gloves and safety glasses. Top of page 123. Avoid skin and eye contact, okay? Avoid skin and eye contact. Add disinfectant to water, okay, when diluting, rather than adding the water to the disinfectant because if you do that, it's going to foam up, which can result in an inaccurate mixing ratio. You want to use tongs uh, or gloves when it comes to removing implements out of the disinfectant solution. Keep disinfectant, of course, out of reach of children. Uh, children, please highlight and put a star where it says immerse the entire implement in disinfectant if the product label calls for complete immersion. I'm not gonna read all of it, but again, a lot of this we already went over. 
um, on what not to do where it says never. Uh, never let quads, phenols, bleach, or any other disinfectant come in contact with your skin. Place any disinfectant or other products in an unmarked container. You never want to do that, okay? Never mix chemicals together unless specify uh, any manufacturer's instructions. So again, you never just want to think, oh, if I mix this with this, it'll work better. It doesn't work that way, all right? Um, disinfecting containers. In the past, jars or containers used to disinfect implements were often incorrectly called wet sanitizers. Disinfectant containers contain disinfectants for disinfecting purposes, not for cleaning. The container you choose must be large enough to contain all items to be disinfected and covered, okay? But not airtight. Remember, to clean the container every day and wear gloves when you are doing so. Always follow the manufacturer's labels instructions for disinfecting products. Again, very repetitive, all right? Keeping a logbook, salon, spas, and barber shops should always follow manufacturer's recommended schedules for cleaning and disinfecting tools and implements. Disinfecting work surfaces, uh, scheduling regular service visits for equipment, and replacing parts when needed. Although your state may may not require you to keep a log book of all equipment usage, cleaning, disinfecting, testing, and maintenance, uh, it may be advised to keep one, all right? Cleaning and disinfecting non-porous reusable items. So please highlight and put a star next to the following. State rules require that all multi-use tools and implements be cleaned and disinfected before every service. Mix all disinfectants according to the manufacturer's directions. You guys are probably tired of hearing me say that, okay? At the bottom of page 124, disinfecting electri electrical tools and equipment. So hair clippers and other types of electrical equipment um, have contact points that cannot be completely submerged an example I can give for us estheticians would be the uh, high frequency electrode. That would be something that you could not completely immerse in the liquid. These items should be cleaned and disinfected using an EPA registered disinfectant designed for the use of these devices. Follow the procedures recommended by the disinfectant manufacturer for preparing the solution to follow the item Again, manufacturer's directions for cleaning and disinfected the device. Okay. On page 125, disinfecting work surfaces. Most states require that all work surfaces be cleaned and disinfected before beginning a service. Be sure to clean and disinfect tables, uh, stations, shampoo sinks, chairs, armrests, everything. Uh, doorknobs and handles daily to reduce transfer of germs um, to your hands, okay? Now, cleaning towels, linens, and capes. Clean towels and linens should be used, uh, obviously, on each client. And some states require freshly laundered capes for every service. To clean towels, linens, and capes, um, again, you want to make sure that you are using bleach uh, with all of your linens, okay, and your towels. Multi-use products. So when using creams, lotions, gels, and other products that is dispensed from a multi-use container, it is important not to contaminate the product, okay? Always use a pump or a shaker to dispense product when possible. For products in a tube or jar, always use a clean spatula, which is what we do, um, Obviously, every time we do have products in jars, we use a spatula to dispense the product and never use your fingers, okay? Soaps and detergents. So, gelatin soaps, also known as gelatin detergents, work to break down stubborn films and remove the residue of products such as scrubs, salts, and masks. The gelatin agents in these soaps work in all types of water, are low subsiding, and are specifically formulated to work in areas with hard tap water. 
Hard tap water reduces the effectiveness of cleaners and disinfectants. If your area has hard tap water, ask your local distributor for soaps that are effective in hard water. This information will be stated on the product's label. All right, we are moving on. We are on page 126. It says, follow standard precautions to protect yourself and your clients. Please put a star and highlight the following. Standard precautions are guidelines published by the CDC that requires that employers and employees to assume that any human blood and body fluids are potentially infectious because it may not be possible to identify clients with infectious diseases whether or not they look sick, strict infection control practices should be used with all clients. In many instances, clients who are just getting sick or are long-term viral carriers are asymptomatic, meaning that they show no symptoms or signs of infection. OSHA and the CDC have set safety standards and precautions that protect employees in situations when they could be exposed to blood, to bloodborne pathogens. So precautions include proper hand washing, uh, wearing gloves, and proper handling and disposing of sharp instruments and any other items that may have been contaminated by blood or other bodily fluids. It is important that specific procedures be followed if blood or bodily fluid is present, okay? So on page 127, it talks about PPE, personal protective equipment. Many chemicals used in the salon or spa or barber shops bear labels that require the use of personal protective equipment such as gloves and safety glasses. When working with their products, however, some equipment such as gloves offer protection from exposure to pathogens and should be worn whenever practical. Gloves. Now, OSHA defines PPEs as specialized clothing or equipment worn by an employee for protection against a hazard. The hazards, this particular standard refers to our bloodborne pathogens, such as hepatitis and HIV. However, beauty professionals are required to prevent their occupational exposure to any amount of blood, no matter how minimal it is, okay? through the use of gloves, mask, and eye protection. Gloves are single-use equipment. A new set is used for every client and at times must be changed during the service. According to the protocol, removal of glove is performed by inverting the cuffs, okay? Inverting the cuffs, pulling them off inside out, and disposing of them into the trash. The gloves taken off first is held in one hand with a glove still on it. The glove with the cuff inverted in is then pulled over the first glove inside out. The first glove is then inside the second one, which has the service side now on the inside against the other glove, okay? And they are disposed of together as shown there on the picture. All right, that's on page 127. This is very important. Again, not only will it be on your written state board exam, but it is now part of, I want to say, every practical uh, test. That includes cosmetology, nail, nail technicians, and of course, estheticians. It is blood exposure incidents, okay? So on page 128, it's talking about blood exposure. An exposure incident contact with blood or bodily fluids. You should never perform a service on any client who comes in with an open, I didn't zoom in, with an opened uh, wound, a rash, or an abrasion. However, sometimes accidents happen while you are actually performing the service. An exposure incident is contact with not intact, which is broken skin, blood, body fluid, or other potential infectious materials 
that is the result of the performance of a worker's duty. Should the client suffer a cut or abrasion that bleeds during a service, follow the steps outlined for the client's safety as well as for your own safety. As a beauty professional, you will likely work with an array of sharp implements and tools and cutting yourself is a very real possibility. If you do suffer a cut, okay, you must follow the steps for an exposure incident, all right? Many of the steps are similar to a client injury, although attending to yourself should be hopefully require fewer soft skills. Okay, so demonstrate safe work practices and safety precautions. Most potential harmful situations in the salon, spa, or barbershops can be avoided by being observant and obviously using common sense. Learn to reorganize safety hazards to minimize the occurrence of, uh, the occurrence of accidents. All right, page 129 at the top, water. At the shampoo bowl, be careful how you handle the spray hose, okay? If the water temperature reaches scalping levels while the hot, uh, make sure that you obviously are checking and letting the client know or asking if the water is okay. As a precaution, always test the water's temperature on the inside of your wrist before applying to the client's scalp, uh, hair and scalp. The same procedure may be used to test uh, steam towels for facials, okay, and for shaving. So again, you always want to make sure that you're taking the precautions before performing these services on the actual client. So again, checking to make sure that the towel is not too hot before putting it over your client's face, which is something that we practice on a daily when doing facial treatments. Tools and appliances. So again, I'm not going to read all of this, you guys, but just to say a few, um, all tools and implements should be in good working conditions. Replace damaged tools immediately, including worn out electrical cords, chip uh, clipper blades, for example, or anything that's cracked. Um, obviously, that is very dangerous. Electrical cords can often threaten to become a safety hazard in a busy shop course the clippers trimmers curling irons all of that you would never want your client to trip over a curling iron or anything like that okay so again never place any tools or implements in your mouth or in your pocket that would not be very smart would it all right page 130 again i'm not going to read absolutely everything i already pretty much read the whole chapter but again equipment and fixtures keep all chairs uh headrest tables lamps everything you know in good working conditions dust and clean regularly to avoid uh, dust buildup and to maintain a clean you know sanitary space ventilation proper ventilation and air circulation is extremely important in today's salon spas and barber shops okay particles from products such as hair sprays and disinfectants can be inhaled and may cause um, an allergic reaction or other health problems Exits. Make sure that your exits should be well marked and identifiable. Um, fire extinguishers. Fire extinguishers should be placed where they are readily accessible. Attire. Again, your clothing should be comfortable and professional in appearance. Excessively baggy clothes can get in the way of performing, um, you know, services. Long hair in a loose style may easily get caught and like a vent or something so be very careful uh what i usually say when doing facial treatments if you do have long hair is that you put it back so that you avoid getting it on the client's face for instance um rings jewelry things that you know dangle or like charm bracelets things that make noise are obviously nothing it's it's not something that you would want to wear again because it can be distracting um to the client all right shoes should be have a non uh skid rubber soles with good support we already talked about that on chapter four uh children okay children can cause serious risk of injury to themselves in a salon all right uh post notices in the reception area advising um you know your clients that children are not to be left unattended you know, with everything going on at the moment, obviously having extra people um, 
in a salon is an absolute no. It's pretty much whoever is getting the service done that is allowed, obviously, in the treatment room or in the salon space. Adult clients, as beauty professionals, many of the things that we do to assure clients' comfort also fall under the category of safety precautions. As you work through your practical skills, you will learn proper protection procedures and chemical application methods to ensure client safety and comfort from the standpoint of avoiding skin irritation, burns, wet or soil clothing, and so forth. However, there are also uh, several common sense services that could be performed. Um, assist clients in and out of the chair or again on the treatment table. Um, we will go further into that when we start doing treatments. Always lower the hydraulic chair to its lowest level. Again, if needed for certain clients, hold the door open for your clients. Again, just common courtesy for your clients. Now, high risk clients, while some customers who know that they have impaired immune systems will share that information with you. Many will not because they are embarrassed, do not know um, the importance or do not know that they actually have a compromised immune system. These people are at a very high risk of infection and they uh, can encounter pathogens because you will not always know who these people are. It is important to practice proper infection control with every client that comes through the door. Um, diabetic customers have immune systems that do not work e effectively and have impaired healing. So a simple nick from a tool that was not properly disinfected may have devastating effects on them. While many people will tell you that they have diabetes if they do, some type two diabetics can be diabetic for years prior to being diagnosed, which means that even if they that even if you do ask, they may say no because they have not been diagnosed yet. So it's something that you obviously want to be very aware of, okay? And not you guys can read through all of this. Um, your professional responsibility. So after studying this chapter, it should be very clear that your responsibility as a beauty professional far exceeds the ability to perform, obviously, a good service. Your most important responsibility is to protect your client health and safety and yours as well. Never take any shortcuts for cleaning and disinfecting. You cannot afford to skip steps in order to save time or money when it comes to safety. It is your responsibility and legal responsibility to follow state and federal laws and rules. Keep your clients current and notify the licensing agency if you move or change your name. Again, you would be notifying TDLR. Again, I am in Texas. And so Texas Department of Licensing and Regulations will be who you would notify of any changes. Check your state's website monthly for any changes or updates, again, with rules and regulations. Be aware of your environment so that you can identify and eliminate potential hazards to make your salon, spa, or barbershop safer for you and for your clients. Be prepared for emergencies, okay? Every salon, spa, or barbershop should have an employee and clientele emergency information available. An emergency phone number checklist should include the contact number for fire, police, poison control, and medical rescue departments, the nearest hospital emergency room, and taxis, okay? Realize that behavior that stems from knowledgeable and caring manner is what separates a true professional from a non-professional. Being a professional is something you can take pride in. All right, you guys, so congratulations on completing this chapter. Now, before you move on, take a moment to think about how these infection control topics apply to your particular discipline, all right? It is important, again, that we start using infection control practices now. Um, that way, it is pretty much will be second nature once you are officially a licensed professional and you will know the ins and out of infection control. I know it was a long chapter, but we are finally done with it. I hope it was helpful to you. And again, remember that 
you want to go over this chapter multiple times and like always we'll see you on the next video